feelings uh, for the state of Tennessee, uh, some of the things that we should be thankful for, such as the uh, Alamo. Uh, we often say, if it had not been for you Tennesseans, we Texicans would still be Mexicans. So <laughs> thank you for the help. Amen. Matter of fact, I have very warm feelings because it was from this very area, after the war between the states, that my loved ones, the Popes, came from this area. Uh, John Lloyd and Joseph Pope came from this area right after the uh, war between the states and came down into East Texas, and that's the home of my father's folks, and so um, uh, I do have warm feelings here. And I love your pastor. I thank the Lord for Brother Norris. Has to be one of my very top, very favorite preachers in all of America. You're blessed to have him as a pastor, and uh, I, I, know that, uh, I know that you received what I just said very well there. It was good to see Brother Wallace, a great veteran of the faith back there, and it was good to get to talk to Joel recently. I praise the Lord for you, Joel, being here on staff. Uh, I, I pray that it has not created a staff infection having you here. I, 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 I kid, bro I, yeah, I kid, brother, I kid, brother, uh, I kid, brother uh, Caleb about being a staff infection. But Caleb Sargent, I want to thank you for all the contribution that you made, uh, brother Kurt. Thank you for the hard work and uh, uh, and what you put into his life. It did pay off. Uh, so I give you greetings from brother uh, Caleb and his dear wife Ruthie. Thank you, Pastor Norris, for on honestly the contribution you put into his life. Because without a good youth pastor, the church is really handicapped. But he's been very, very loyal and stays really positive and, and stays up and, and supports uh, uh, my personal convictions, which is a great, valuable thing there. So thank you for that. And good to have you here on Wednesday night on this inclement weather. I, I have to tell you, I'm surprised in a good way. When I saw those dark clouds rolling in, I said, there goes the crowd to my wife. But uh, I think that uh, you have a faithful quality here. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to tomorrow night. And it is good to have my wife with you. Thank you for inviting her to come as well. I'm always better behaved when she's around. Amen. Which is a scary thing, you know. Um, but also, uh, I, I saw Ruthie back there and Michael. God bless you. Uh, their boy is down in our church. You know, he's an attorney of law now. It's hard to believe. But uh, good to see. And, and I think she's Ruth. When I met her, she was a teenager. Yeah, it's hard to believe in Memphis, Tennessee. But anyway, I love you all, and, and if I start recognizing everybody here that means something to me, I'd be a while, wouldn't I? So let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to have you turn with me to about three different places. And I think as we read the Scripture, you'll probably get a, a hint of where we're going to be going in the message as we read the Scripture. The first place I would like you to read with me would be Job 7. Then we'll be going from Job 7 to the book of Lamentations. And then for the book of Lamentations 3, chapter 3, we'll be going over to Isaiah 50. First of all, we'll be in Job 7, 17 and 18, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, then Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. Job 7 is the first place, and we'll go there from there to Lamentations. And, you know, if you could do this, it, it would, it would uh, save uh, some time, but also I think it would add to the unity of what I'm trying to express tonight. Lamentations of Jeremiah, right after the book of Jeremiah. If you can go ahead and kind of get there and get started, uh, maybe put the church bulletin in the Lamentations, and maybe the week before last bulletins and over there in Isaiah 50. Okay. All right. All right. Those bulletins come in so handy, don't they? Amen. All right. Okay. First of all, Job 7, verses 17 and 18. Job 7, 17 and 18. This is a very similar passage of Scripture that you'll hear from Psalm 8. But Job says something here uh, that was not said in Psalm 8 in this most ancient book of the Bible. Please notice what it says, verse 17 and 18, Job 7. What is man that thou shouldest magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning and try him every moment? Please notice, visit him every morning. What is man? Then notice what it says in Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. 
it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And again, please notice, new every morning. Then if you'll notice in Isaiah 50, this is commonly known as a messianic prophecy. We know this for sure because of what it says in verse 6. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. See, I, Schofield's note is very correct about this. He says, Christ was so brutally beaten and mistreated during the effect of the cross and what led up to the cross that he didn't even look human. Um, I gave my back to the smiters. I'm sorry, that's what C.I. Schofield said about Isaiah 52, 14, when he says, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred. But here it talks about him being beaten and the cheeks, uh, the hairs plucked right off. And then it said in Isaiah 52, 14, in other words, he didn't even look human. Notice the words just before them. These, think of these words as being said to us, because indeed they were through the first person, of Jesus Christ through the prophet Isaiah. Verse 4, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Now notice the wording here. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. The Lord hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. Notice again the phrase, He wakeneth, morning by morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then I'll ask you to please be seated. Heavenly Father, for the word of God tonight, we thank you. I want to thank you for safe journey and mercies to be here tonight. We thank you for Franklin Road Baptist Church. We thank you for the dear pastor here and the great legacy of this church. On this evening, dear God, we pray for blessing and help. We ask you to give us some shoe leather Christianity tonight, Lord. Something we can walk in, something we can use. And when all is said and done, may we say in our hearts, I was glad when they said unto me, go to, let us go to the house of the Lord. Bless us now with the manifestation of thy presence. Bind the hands of Satan. You said where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So take full liberty tonight. Help me, Lord, to be your conduit to say what you want me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. If I could um, bring your attention back to the book of Job in verse number 39, you know, God gave a bunch of questions to Job and all of his friends when they asked him a lot of questions that he didn't answer. But he had all these questions at the end of the book of Job. And what God was talking about was, look at my creation. In other words, where were you when I was doing all of this? That's always a good question when you think that you're exasperated and you can't go further and you're wondering how things can work out. If God can put the sun up yonder in the tabernacle of the heavens, if he can put the moon shining like a yellow jonquil in full boom, bloom, if he can scoop out and make the places for the ocean, fill it up with water, rope it off of sand, he can take care of you. Consider the lilies of the field. And I love this. God says in verse number 19 of Job 39, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. I mean, God is bragging about the creation of the horse, but especially the horse at war, the war horse. He paweth in the valley. Did you ever hear Brother Roloff preach that sermon? Pawed in the valley. And rejoiceth in his strength, he goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear. What a great thing, isn't it? He makes fun of fear. And is not affrighted, neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and shield. He swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. He gets excited when it's time to fight. And you've heard this expression, maybe you've said this expression, when you're happy about something, you sometimes say, I just can't believe that, you know, and fill in the blanks. And it's like God is saying about his horse when the trumpets of battle sound. It says, um, he swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage, neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. He saith among the trumpets, ha ha! It's an unusual thing, isn't it? God says the 
horses laughing when he hears the trumpet that sounds forth to war. And he smelleth a battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. When the ancient countries would go into battle, they would travel many times through the night, get as little sleep as was required, and then as the morning would break, the trumpets would sound, the men would go forth to war. Here, the war horse, here's the sound of the trumpet. He is not afraid of the battle. He is not afraid of the glittering uh, uh, acronyms of war, the sword, he's the spear, he's ready for battle. He paws in the valley with excitement. His nostrils are flaring. He eats up the ground. He runs so fast. When he hears the sound of the trumpets, he laughs with glee. Ha ha, the Bible says. Now, keeping that in mind, the three passages of Scripture that we read for the text, did you pick up what it said? In the seventh chapter of Job, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And then he says that thou visit him every morning. He says in Lamentations that um, God's mercies are renewed to us every morning. Jesus speaking through his prophets says, God has given me a learned ear with a learned tongue and he wakes me up morning by morning. Jess Moody, pastoring down many years ago in West Palm Beach, Florida, had a young preacher friend that got frustrated in ministry and burned out and resigned his pastorate. And as you well know, for those of you that are called into the work of the Lord, that the calling of God is without repentance to preach. On this night, we have a retired preacher in our pulpit who pastored in Austin, Texas for over 30 years, a wonderful man of God. And I asked him, I said, Brother David Burkholder, I said, would you consider uh, preaching for us Wednesday night? Oh, Brother Pope, I'll be happy to. And then there's another church south of us that needed a pulpit a supply, and I called him and I said, Brother Burkholder, I said, I got another place for you to preach. Are you welcome? He said, I'm ready to go. My friend Mickey Carter down in central Florida has had homes where many a missionary and pastor has retired to. And um, we're going to get back to Jess Moody in just a minute. I hadn't forgotten that, but I want to do some fill in here. And Brother Carter and I were talking into the wee hours of the morning one night. And he said, you know, Brother Pope, I see these old preachers come in here. And some of them have cars that were given to them as a gift when they resign. A gold watch. And some of them are called out every week or so at first to go preach somewhere. And then it tapers off. And then it's twice a month. And then it's once a month. And then it's twice a year, and then it's once a year, and then they don't get called out. I see them sitting in the services at first on the edge of their seat, like preacher boys in the preacher college. But then as the invitations stop, their shoulders slump, they look a little bit saddened. I shake their hand, but there's not that spring in their step. Brother Carter was one of my father's students in seminary many, many years ago, and so we were reared down in central Florida, and uh, he spoke up to me and said, Johnny, you've been down to Sarasota. I think it's kind of sad after 150 years they're closing up the circus. But he said, Johnny, you know how down there in Sarasota how the Barnum and Bailey Ringling Brothers' horses are put out to pasture, the ones that would pull the old circus wagon. He said it's the neatest thing. They can be broken in the back, bowed down, can hardly lift up a hoof. But when they hear the calliope, when they hear the circus wagon, he said it's an amazing thing. They throw that head up in the air. They straighten that old bowed back as best they can. They lift up those hoofs and they begin to prance just like they were pulling the wagon again. 
He said, Brother Pope, I watch these old preachers that hadn't been invited out for, to preach for a while. And I'll say something like this, Brother so-and-so, I'm going to need a pulpit supply on this Wednesday night. Do you reckon that you could preach for me pretty soon? They pull that head up. They throw those hoofs back. They begin the prance because the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Going back to Jess Moody, the young preacher came back into the office three months after he had resigned the pastorate. And he said to him, tell me, what do you miss most? His words were these. The young man who resigned his pastorate said, I miss the trumpets in the morning. The trumpets that call me forth to the perfect will of God for my life. The voice of God in my life. And this is the most amazing thing to me. This kind of sunk in on me a few months ago. And I haven't been able to shake it since. Now, any time is a good time to pray. Evening, morning, and at noon will I pray. Seven times a day David talked about praising God. Any time is a good time to pray. But there's something about the voice of the Lord as soon as you wake up. In the prequel of Peter Pan, we have these words of Tinkerbell. You know that place between sleep and awake? The place where you can still remember dreaming? That's where I'll always love you. That's where I'll be waiting, Peter. Said to Peter Pan. You know you're in a deep message when the pastor is quoting Tinkerbell. <laughs> it is an amazing thing to me how fiction imitates reality. You see... I'm going to suggest to you, my friend, that God is still talking. A little lady said to me some years ago, isn't it a shame that God isn't calling more young men to preach? I said, ma'am, He is still calling them. They're just not surrendering. The Bible says no less than 15 times in the New Testament, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matter of fact, if you have your Bibles, look it over here at Mark chapter 4 for just a moment. I had not planned to read this verse. It's kind of a pop-up, but I think that I have liberty and I to read a pop-up here. Notice what it says in Mark's gospel chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. It says in verse number 23, the words of Jesus, If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Now I'm not going to ask for anybody to raise a hand, but... How many of you wives know that men can have ears of perfect hearing but yet not hear? I wonder how many of you have teenagers that have perfectly good hearing but don't hear? All right, you don't have to look around, you don't have to look far. Verse 30, verse 24 rather, Mark 4, And he said unto them, Take heed what ye hear. With what measure you meet it shall be measured to you and unto you that here shall more be given. Let me just stop there for a moment and back up. Put it in reverse. And unto you that here shall more be given. That reminds me of Psalm 36 and verse number 9. In thy light shall we see light. Since the word of God is a light into our path, you know, right? He doesn't give it 10 miles down the road, but he puts that light right in our pathway. Word is a lamp unto our feet, light into our path. You know, many times we want to know what the custom will of God is for us, don't we? For these 36 years of pastoring the same church, I can tell you that I'm centered in the perfect will of God tonight. Yet I never saw where it said, Johnny, thou shalt go to Houston. Not a doubt in my mind, 43 years ago when I married that wonderful woman I'm married to, sitting here tonight, not a doubt in my mind, I didn't marry a girl, I married the girl I was supposed to marry. But yet I never saw the verse that says, thou shalt marry her. I even believe the very Bible college I went to at that time was the best college for me. But yet I never saw a verse that said, thou shalt go here. 
But what I am saying is that there are very general words from the Lord in Scripture. If we ignore the general word of God, He will not give us the specific will of God in the custom-made will of God for us. I'm kind of getting off track a little bit, but for instance, you find in places like 1 Thessalonians 4, this is the will of God, abstain from fornication. You know, when God says, this is my will, that you are to be sanctified, separated, and abstain from fornication, you don't have to guess, you don't even have to pray whether or not you should, because it's right there. Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. And Paul said to Thessalonica, pray without ceasing. You don't have to pray whether or not to pray. Good morning, Lord. I, 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 should I pray or not? No, you, he commanded us to pray. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Two things there. You don't have to pray whether or not you should fulfill the Great Commission. And actually, if you think about it, you don't even have to pray about who to witness to. If they qualify as a creature, give them the gospel. To every creature. Right? God didn't step back and say, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. this one stays and that one goes. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know what that means in the Greek? Whole world. God, the, God, the world God loved and gave himself for. Now here's what I'm saying. Many times we're ignoring what the Bible plainly says. And maybe tomorrow night we'll remind uh, our friends at the banquet that the Bible says husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church. Well, you, you, so obey what you hear from God. You know what? On a Wednesday night at Franklin Road Baptist Church, I don't think that that's the problem. I'm looking at people who came out not only on Wednesday night prayer meeting, but came out on a stormy night. Our problem is, listen to me carefully, that I think that many times we're not starting our days off correctly. A few moments ago, I walked into the room, that preparation room before we came in here. When I saw your pastor and he saw me, I did not ignore him. I immediately opened my arms, gave him an embrace, how you doing? I was glad to see him. I, I think that we might have had a hard time getting ready for our service tonight if I was in the same room with him and I kind of cornered myself off and didn't say a word to him. But now, he's only a man. I'm only a man. I'm submitting to you that according to God's word, every morning he's waking up his kids. Every morning... Job said, he visits us. Jeremiah said, they're renewed every morning, these mercies of God. It's of his mercies that we're able to stay alive through the night. You know, I think about some of these people who go through these sleep tests and they said, my, 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 they found out that I stopped breathing so many times through the night. And the guys that are telling me this are in their 60s. Well, what, it wasn't a machine that kept them going through the night for 60 years. I'm not saying that they didn't stop breathing, but isn't that an amazing thing? They stop breathing all through the night and God kicks them up, jump starts it through the night. You know, It's of the Lord's mercies that any of us are here. And every morning, He seems to be waking us up. I'm going to be honest with you. I want to challenge everybody here, when you get up in the morning, don't get up real fast. In that twilight, when you're in between that sleep time and awake time, listen carefully because God's got a word for you. And now for several months I've been practicing this and it appears that when I'm waking up, if I'm just still for just a moment, it seems like there's a word from the Lord that comes to me. You say, does God speak to you? I'm not talking about audibly, but louder than that, to your heart, to your spirit. God will speak to you if you're listening. He that hath ears, let him hear. He, if he said it once, that's enough. But he said it 15 times. He that hath ears, let him hear. 
And if you want to hear more, you better start listening up now. Trumpets in the morning. Are you hearing those trumpets in the morning? Are you thrilling at the voice of the Lord like the war horse pawing the valley? Can't wait to hear what you have to say to me, Lord. Let me throw three things out at you for just a little bit tonight. Why do we have those trumpets silent in the morning? Why are we not hearing that voice oftentimes in the morning? I would submit to you, number one, desire for more. Now the promise of Jesus in John chapter 10 and verse number 10 was this, the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and destroy. Then he said, but I am come that ye might have life and that you might have it, here it is, more abundantly. The life that we have in Jesus is a more abundant life. Everything we need we have in Jesus Christ. Yet the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth the corn, and the labor is worthy of his hire. He is saying, listen to me. He said, I'm watching out for my men. I'm watching out for my people. And I'm going to see to it that they get paid, that their needs will be met. Not far from 1 Timothy 5, we see also these words in 1 Timothy 6. If you have your Bibles, slip over to 1 Timothy 6, and I want you to see something, if you would, with me. 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 6. 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 6. Here it says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You that are godly, be content. It says in verse number 7, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. I have been preaching funerals for over four decades. I've never yet seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It is certain we carry nothing out of this world. One man said to his friend when he read in the newspaper about the wealthiest man in town dying, said, I wonder how much he left behind. The answer, all of it. Then he went on to say in verse 8, 1 Timothy 6, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. That is an amazing statement. In the United States of America, most all of us don't have to pray whether or not we're going to eat tomorrow. We're just concerned with what we're going to eat. We didn't have to worry about what we would, if we were going, to, were going to be wearing anything, but what we would wear. Yet God said, if you've got food at the table today, give us this day our daily bread. If you've got clothes on your back today, be content. Then it says in verse 9, but they that will be rich. My friends, I've seen people that have money but money does not have them. I've met people who did not have money, but money had them. See, it says, they that will be rich, those that have this longing, this insatiable desire to have riches, fall in the temptation and the snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. It has been said the most, one of the most torturous deaths is the death of drowning. You know, this is one reason why some people really get all upset when they hear about people who have been waterboarded. It's not that they're drowning, but it gives the sensation of drowning. For drowning is one of the most torturous things that one can go through. God says what's really torturous is a person who lives with this constant, insatiable desire to have more than what God has given you. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many arrows. It's like a person who's drowning. It's like a person being shot with arrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. 
Just a few verses later in that same sixth chapter, it says in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust, now look at what it says here, in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. I pastor a man who for four years, the business that he started was the fastest growing small business, according to the Wall Street Journal, in the United States of America. When he came to the top of his profession and was ready to sell out, he gave each one of his sons a million dollars worth of stock. He himself had a million, pardon me, he himself had 40 million dollars just to retire with. Some of you remember just a few years ago, 2008, there was a downturn economically. His boys that had a million dollars worth of stock said, Dad, should we sell? They dropped to 800000 He said, don't worry, boys, it's coming back. Dad, it's 600000 Should we sell? Hang in, boys, it's going to be okay. Long story short, both the boys got out with $2,000 each. Million dollars of stock, now 2000 My friend that I pastored, $40 million, lost it all. Every bit of it. I mean driving the nicest car, living in the nicest houses. Now everything's changed. Total paradigm. All of it gone. The inheritance he left with the son, gone. But I will tell you this. Through that time, he stayed as faithful to church kept his smile, kept that spring in his step, kept on going, we talked about it. His whole attitude was it was only money. I've still got Jesus. He's got the joy of the Lord, which is his strength. I'm around the man and it's obvious to me that he has this close personal relationship with the Lord. Years ago when it became popular to teach in our so-called schools of higher learning that God is dead, a dear uneducated preacher built a magnificent sermon if God is dead. And his points went something like this. Number one, if God is dead, why wasn't I notified since I'm next of kin? Number two, if God is dead, who were his pallbearers? Number three, if God is dead, where is he buried? And I love this. Number four, if God is dead, who did I talk to this morning? You know, you don't have to convince a man that life is worth living who has a constant, daily relationship with Jesus Christ. Renewed every morning, the voice of the Lord every day. But I will tell you this, my friends, hardly anything can silence the voice of God faster than when we begin to want more than what God has given us. My God shall supply all, not some, but all your need. And I love this, according to his riches in Christ Jesus. If I'm worth a million and I see you have a need and I give you $250, I just paid you out of my riches. But if I give you $250,000, I paid you according to my riches. God says, I will meet every need you have according to my riches. There's one little word there that we sometimes forget. All our need, not our greed. One of the greatest things that God can do for us many times is to not give us everything we want. When our oldest child was just a toddler, she was perpetual motion. I mean, that girl was so fast, she would, her mama turned her back one day, she got on a tricycle and went around the block. Boy, Barbara uh, notified everybody and they were searching when we found her and she came scooting back in there. Where were you, honey? And she was on the move. Our next door neighbor's kid named David got one of these electronic cars. She wanted one so badly she began to cry. She wanted that for Christmas so badly. But I knew my daughter, perpetual motion. I mean, she was hard to keep still with a tricycle. If I gave her something with a motor in it, I'd be almost suicidal for her sake, I should say. 
So I did not let the tears move me. I knew that that was not what would be good for her. Many of us may not lean on those everlasting arms if we have the strength of men to lean upon. And we're forgetting that it is always only temporary. This is why one of the best things that can happen to the church is just every now and then, at least once a year, to haul off and hit stewardship. To remind us of faith promise or of giving to missions. Don't get too attached to the money. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, never ever forget this. Tithing is not a matter of generosity. Tithing is a matter of honesty. For the tithe is the Lord's. And it's a way of saying, God, you own everything. Wherein have you robbed me, he said, in tithes, but not just in tithes, but in offerings. I've never known a man that's blessed of God that's selfish. I've never known a person blessed of God that isn't generous. Generous with their time, generous with their money. It just doesn't go hand in hand because God is into giving. Years ago, a preacher came and preached for me from Georgia. Really touched my heart. He had one son. He said, I remember that boy. Seemed like he was always going to the doctor. He was an expensive thing. And then his teeth were crooked. He had to get braces. You ever price braces? And then if that wasn't enough, he wanted to go to college and... Where he wanted to go, he could hardly afford, and so we helped him. Matter of fact, they put him all the way through Georgia Tech Master's Program. He said, every time I turned around, that boy was costing me money. He said, but not long after he got his master's degree, before he could start his work, I believe, as an engineer, he died in a very sad and bizarre accident. And I'll never forget what this preacher said to me. Since he's passed, he's never cost us a dime since. Since he died, we've never been out anything. After the funeral's over, that was it. He never cost us a thing. I'll never forget this preacher. Barbara, you probably remember, he got in our pulpit. He said, folks, if a church is dead, don't worry about it. It's not going to cost you anything. But if a church is growing, if a church is alive, it's going to cost you something. That preacher hauled off and said, man, I'd be glad to have my boy back and start financing anything I need to finance. If he wants a PhD, let's go for it, boy. If I could just have him back. Oh, we forget so soon that God has chosen for us to do what it says in Luke 6.38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. And I love what God said here, what Jesus said here. Shall men give into your bosom. Do you know what that means? That means God will bless you in your business. He can rain money from heaven if he wanted to. He could grow down trees if he wanted to. But he was simply saying, in whatever endeavor you've been placed in, I will bless you in your business if you give to me. Sometimes we just need to give it for no other reason to let the Lord know that money doesn't own us. That God owns us. And some of you might wonder, why is it I wake up in the morning and I hear what Brother Pope said, there's trumpets, I mean, there's the voice of God ready to talk to me. Why aren't I hearing the Lord? It may be over the simple thing that you have this desire for more, meaning more than what God has given you. You're not content with such things as you have. Paul said, I have learned. (laughs) You notice that? I have learned. It doesn't come natural. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. What else messes with us about this thing of hearing the voice of the Lord? I would submit to you doubt. Doubt. 
You know, if you think about how important it is, Jesus said if we have the faith of the grain of a mustard seed. Now, when we think about how small a mustard seed is, we might think, boy, that's, that's really little. But then when you, when you consider what a mustard seed can do when it's planted, it can break concrete when it starts growing. So it's like Jesus is saying, listen, just invest what little you have. Turn with me to Mark 11. Turn with me to Mark 11. Invest what little you have. Like the man who said, remember, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And by the way, he saw the miracle, didn't he? He said, Lord, look at it. I'm not a champion in this, but I... I'm going to believe with all that I have. In Mark chapter 11 it says, And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Shall not doubt in his heart. What does it mean to doubt? Literally, the word there means to be in two minds. There is one Greek word for doubt that means suspended like a shooting star. Kind of hanging out over nothing. Kind of like being on the Ferris wheel and you're at the very top and a double Ferris wheel and it stops and you're walking back and forth. I don't know about you, but I don't like that feeling. No way. I remember going to the Penzoil building downtown Houston where one of our guys worked and it's in a perfect triangle and it's glass. He said, preacher, come here and stand. And I stood in the corner and you can fill the building going this way and that way. And, and you know, we're, <laughs> whoa, we're about 70 stories up. Listen, I didn't like that. That's what it means to doubt. You're suspended in midair. Uh, matter of fact, James 1 talks about being like a wave driven with the wind and tossed. Doubt can bring us down. If you have your Bibles, look at Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. This is a passage of scripture I've been thinking about for months and, and I can't get away from it. And um, So I share it with you tonight. God is talking about Abraham in verse 17 of Romans 4. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is a promise that God gave to Abraham when he didn't have any children and he and his wife were both past childbearing. So he even changed his name from Abraham, father to, a, to I'm sorry, Abram, father to Abraham, father of a multitude. Before him who, let me write, re, come back, verse 17. Chapter 4, Romans, as it is written, I made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's what God can do. Call those things which be not as though they were. Remember 1 John 5, he, if we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. We, knows that he's, he's, we know that He's going to answer us. And then it says in verse number 18, who against hope believed in hope. God says, and this is an encouragement to our faith, He speaks of things which are not in existence as though they were and they come into existence. Who against hope, Abraham believed in hope. Against the evidence that he had, he sided with God 
who speaks the worlds into existence and he spoke of him that he would have kids and they would become a multitude. So he sided with God, not with man, not with humanity and says, I'm throwing my fragile hope to the wind and I'm taking heavenly hope as my guide and I'm believing those things which are not as though they were and God said they would be. If you would say to the mountain, be removed and be cast and say, not doubt in your heart. I think that sometimes doubt is one of the hardest things to get over. But until we get over that doubt, we're going to be in trouble. Look at one of our great problems is we believe too much. I hope this doesn't blow your mind. We believe too much in our own belief. huh? And there's a lot of power of positive thinking that's still around. I remember Norman, Norman Vincent Pill, the power of positive thinking. Remember the old time preacher said, the more I read Pill, he's appalling. The more I read Paul, he's appealing. Amen. And it's still in the United States of America. Just think positive. Just believe God. You can be a champion. You can be whatever you want to be, whatever you want to be. A bunch of greedy people wondering, why is my faith not holding? I'm, I'm believing, I'm believing. You know, you know what you're believing? You're believing in your own belief. You're believing in your own belief. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but our own belief is fragile. Our own hope is fragile. We've got to get so one with Jesus that we borrow his faith. Let me give you for instance, Galatians 2. I'm crucified with Christ. Christ died for us vicariously, substitutionally in our place. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth within me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Remember what the Lord said? Remember what the Bible teaches us? We love him because he first loved us. You didn't choose me, John 15, remember? I've chosen you. You didn't take the initiative here. I did. You're only giving me agape love because I put it in you to begin with. I live by the faith of the Son of God. So if my faith is bolstered and the just shall live by his faith and the just shall live by faith, I am living on the faith of Jesus. By the way, that's not isolated. You can find this in other places like 2 Timothy 2.13. It says, if we believe not, Yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. God makes a demarcation between apostates who reject and deny, like Judas Iscariot. He went out from us because he was not of us, making a line of demarcation between people like Simon Peter who have a lapse of faith. Remember what Jesus said to Simon Peter? Satan, I desire to sift you as wheat. He said, nevertheless, I have prayed for thee, I love this, that thy faith fail not. So when I talk about having faith to move mountains, I come to this realization evermore that I live by the faith of the Son of God. And Jesus said, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. He said, Peter, listen to me, your faith is pooping out. I am praying for you to have that faith to move the mountains. And many times the devil will tell you when you have a lapse of faith that it's over. That God can't use you. You ever had the devil tell you that? By the way, let me encourage you, okay? Let me encourage you. And I, everybody breathe in as deeply as you can. Ready? Okay, exhale. Okay, okay everybody try it again. One more time. Okay, exhale. They say three's a charm, okay? One more time. Okay, how many are able to do that? 
Okay, then God can still use you. Can I do my imitation of Elvis Presley? Will that be okay? Okay. I know that's cruel, isn't it? Now, folks, when you're like this, God's through with you on earth. When you're dead, God's through. But if you're here breathing, God can use you. Matter of fact, you're ridiculous to argue with God. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're breathing means that God can still use you. But Brother Pope, I, I'm telling you, I just don't have the faith that he can use me. Let me read it to you again. 2 Timothy 2.13 If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You know, there are some people that believe this, that, you know, that believe that you can lose your salvation. By the way, isn't it good to know that we cannot? Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is by believing pass from death unto life. You cannot come into condemnation. You can't get lost if you wanted to. If you really believe, if you really had an experience of the grace of God, as old one preacher said, you could swing out over a hill on a rotten corn stalk, sing amazing grace, and spit the devil in the eye. Once saved, always saved. Jesus said, All that the Father giveth me, John 6, 37, shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You know what that means in the deep theological underlying message? No wise cast out. You know what that means in Greek? No wise cast out. You know what that means in Texan? No way, Jose. One saved, always saved. I've heard people ridiculously say to me, well, okay, you believe in Jesus, you're saved. Well, what if you stop believing? All right, what if you do? What if you do? 2 Timothy 2.13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You know why? Because when Jesus died for you in that vicarious death and you accepted the finished work of Jesus, it is done. Wherefore he's able also even to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. See, he ever lived to make intercession for us, for such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from the sinners, who need not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once when he offered up himself Hebrews 7 25 through 27 what about that and once you are saved he has taken your place he's finished the work and you can never get out of this thing if we believe not he abideth faithful if he were to deny you he would deny himself and he cannot deny himself well, Brother Pope, what's your point? I, I, I mean, I believe that. I, I'm, I, I'm not worried about my salvation. You're just worried that he'll never answer another prayer. You're just worried that he'll never use you again. Can you stay with me in thought for just a moment? If he saves you and he keeps you and he wants to use you, my friends, if you feel weak, that's not a place to surrender and give up that's a place to surrender and say take over Lord take over because here's the deal when you can believe God for those things which are not that they will come to pass for that mountain that needs to be moved that will be moved when it does get moved guess who gets alone the credit for it God does I am convinced my friend that God is just waiting to bless a church enormously where the human explanation is pretty well removed. Many times we get that doubt of mind and we just can't go on. That's the time to believe the Lord and to trust Him more than ever. When do we stop hearing those trumpets in the morning, that sweet voice of God when we wake up? When there's a death of the message, doubt of mind, desire for more, and the death of the message. We mentioned about the Great Commission a while ago, but I think that sometimes we think that we have evolved past the Great Commission. And yet God said in 2 Timothy 4, 2, preach the word be instant in season and out of season. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I 
you. Well, the reason we have a preacher is so, so that he'll do our soul winning for us. I won't belabor this point, but I'll give you something interesting to think about. As a rule, sheep give birth to other sheep, not just the shepherd. <laughs> sheep give birth to other sheep. Your pastor is not commissioned to do your soul winning for you. And how many times preachers sometimes are criticized because maybe the church is not growing as much as it should. Well, if that preacher would get more people down the aisle. Let me ask you a question. How many are you getting down the aisle? How many do you even witness to in the course of a week? Why would you be critical of the pastor or the staff? If you look at 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12, you see the working of the body of Christ and you see all these different members who have a part. And without that body working together, even God got sarcastic and talked about, is the whole body one member? If we only saw a gigantic eyeball here, that would be a monster. Or just a leg by itself coming down here, right? But we are members of the body of Christ. You know, if you think about what is the job of a preacher, Acts 6, 4, but we will give ourselves continue to prayer in the ministry of the Word. That's really his job as pastor, ministry of the Word and prayer. Overseeing the flock of God. Making sure that we're doing our job. Has there been a death of the message? The gospel is our message. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I ask a question, when's the last time you ever spoke to anybody about Jesus? When's the last time you won somebody to the Lord Jesus? Jesus said in John 4, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they're white, all ready to harvest. A lot of times we think, well, with the condition of our world right now, just no use in trying to witness, because it's harder than it used to be. You know the Bible says, where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. I'm thinking of a lady that I baptized Sunday night, reared in an Islamic country, devout Muslim. She was in our services the other day, and on that day I just hauled off and paid tribute to what I believe the Bible teaches against heresy and against false teachings such as the belief of the Islamic faith. Pay tribute to Muhammad, who was anything but a prophet. Demonized, yes, but not a prophet from God. And I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't even that kind. So I got through preaching. I went to the Fellowship Cafe to shake hands with visitors. And here comes this lady from this Muslim country with tears. And she says, everything you said about Muhammad is true. Everything you said about Muslims are true. And she said, I have renounced Muhammad, I have renounced Allah, I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Hey, I'll be honest with you, I kind of felt proud. I said, boy, I hauled off and I let them Muslims have it. Yeah. So I'm getting ready to baptize her this last Sunday night. And she said in her broken accent, can I say a word for Jesus? I said, you sure can. And here's what she said. My neighbors, Rudy and Helen, were so kind to me. I never knew such love. I never saw such love. And when I saw what they had, I had to have what they had. And it was Rudy and Helen that were instrumental in winning her Jesus. It wasn't my doctrinal theses against Islam. It wasn't the preacher. It was the people in our neighborhood that were members of our church that happened to know Jesus and weren't trying to just be good Christians on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They decided to be a good Christian to the lady next door. 
whose Muslim husband, by the way, had beat her. He was incarcerated because he got away with it in Islam countries, but not in America, thank God. I never knew such love. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you're my disciples by the love you have one for the other. Have you ever noticed how evangelistic, and this sounds almost too simplistic, but seriously, how evangelistic our Lord was in everything that he said to stir us up. You are the light of the world. You're the salt. You're the city on the hill. Shine forth. Folks, if there's a death of the gospel message in our life, don't be surprised if you're not hearing the voice of the Lord. I remember years ago, Dr. John R. Rice said, the closest thing to the heart of God is soul winning. That's what Jesus had in mind when he was dying for sinners on the cross. Must I go in empty-handed? Must I meet my Savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty-handed go? Psalm 126, 5 and 6, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with me. Bringing the sheaves with yourself, with you. You have this ability. To be a witness, to make a difference. Oh, that we might care for what God cares for in this world. Let us not be like Jonah running away from God's will and God's message, but let us surrender to God's message and His will for our life. I'll just be real honest with you, folk. Anybody can get backslidden on this matter of being a witness and a soul winner. A couple years ago, I found myself slipping. And I, and I got under conviction and I said, Lord, I am sorry. What the Lord was speaking to my heart, that I just wasn't taking advantage of every opportunity he was giving me. And I said, I tell you what, Lord, I have been messing up, so I, I'm going to take better advantage of every opportunity you give me. So when you give me an opportunity, I'm going I'm to run that thing down. And I'm going to be looking for the opportunity, Lord. And I remember... The next morning or so, I woke up with this song in my mind. Remember this one? Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Man, I was bummed. I was thinking about that song. I had a things-to-do list that long. I was making hospital calls, and you know how the traffic can build up. I, I, I saw some of your traffic. We get a little traffic in Houston, too. And boy, I started making the early hospital calls and the traffic started building up and I was going to make a shortcut across the street called Red Oak to come down FM 1960 to start going to the next hospital in the Sci Fair District. And I'm coming down this side street and I'm passing the bus stop or getting ready to pass the bus stop and I see a young man sitting in the bus stop. It was like a silhouette cut out and he's looking up like this and I'm looking at him and I heard the voice of the Lord. Okay. You told me to take advantage of opportunity, witness to him. I said, Lord, have you seen my things to do list? And then I thought, he's waiting for a bus. He, he's going to be in a hurry to go somewhere. And I heard God say, witness to him. And I said, look, Lord, there's not even a good place to pull over here. And as soon as I said that, I saw a parking place right behind the bus stop. Don't argue with the Lord. He always wins. So I pulled over. And this is no joke, the very Bible that I'm having in my hand right here. Remember we were taught in Bible college when you're going to be a soul winner, have a New Testament that fits in your pocket and be very tactful. Hi, how are you? That's a nice shirt that you have there. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty girl. Looks just like you, Daddy. You know, be tactful, be kind. Well, I didn't have my soul winner's New Testament. I had my C.I. Schofield 1912 Bible right here, buddy. And I wasn't very tactful. The guys at the bus stop, I'm doing this because the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord. Talk to him. And I got close to him. And I said, are you a Christian? His head snapped around. And then I pointed at this like I had an Uzi in my hand. In other words, if you died right now, do you know for sure you go to heaven? And I said it just like that. And I, and I noticed this obvious accent. He said, no, I don't know that for sure. Well, I said, if I could show you in the Bible how to be a Christian, would you be interested? He said, oh, I would, sir. And I felt like saying, 
No, really. <laughs> no, I just said, do you really, you really want me to show? He plays there. And I went, the Bible says in Romans 3.10, the Bible says in Romans 3.23, Romans 6.20, when I got to Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin and death, but to get the God of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I was going about that fast. Here comes the bus. Boom. And you know how they, they kneel, they, go, they open the door, and I said, look, there's your bus, here's a gospel track. It basically says the same thing I would have said to you, here, read this. No, no joke, he put one hand underneath my hand in the track, another hand on top of the track, and he said, oh, no, there'll be another bus. Tell me more, sir. I felt like I was in a David Copperfield kind of a... <laughs> Charles, I feel like, no, you can't have more. Yeah. That's all. Take that. And, and he's holding my hand on the track. And I look at the bus driver and I said, and he looked at me and he went, <laughs> drove away. So I thought, if that kid wants to know the gospel this seriously, looked like he was in his mid-20s, I'm going to give it to him. And it was kind of a warm morning. I took my coat off. I opened up that Bible. At that time, I was preaching through what the religion of the world believed. And I was preaching from, from Genesis to Revelation. And he was sitting there going. And I was going. The I didn't have to worry about anybody bothering us. I mean, if they got near it, you know, just. Ooh, yeah. I mean, I'm sweating giving him the gospel. I'm getting excited. He wants Jesus. I said, right now, would you pray and ask the Lord to save you? He said, I would, sir. I said, I'll pray first, then you. Okay. And so I prayed another sermon. You ever done that? Prayed another sermon. I said, right here, right now, pray. He said, Lord Jesus. And he prayed the most beautiful sinner's prayer, asking the Lord to come into his heart and save him. And then he looked at me and I looked at him. I was on my knees and he was sitting there on that bench. His old dark eyes filled with tears and said, You know, you know, I can't believe you stopped today. It was like that horse. He couldn't believe the trumpets were sounding. I can't believe you stopped today. I really say, I couldn't believe I stopped either. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I was reared in England. All I've ever known is the Muslim way and the Islam faith. It's all I've ever known. Now sitting here in this bus stop, I've only been in America for 10 weeks, and I sat in this bus stop and I looked up in the heavens and I said, Allah, I don't believe in you. Allah, you've never answered one of my prayers. And besides, you scare me. You scare me. And then me says to myself, if there's a God anywhere in this universe, if there's a God anywhere, reveal yourself to me right now. And at that very moment, you came around the corner and asked me if I was a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? I said, by George, you've got it. No, 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 I didn't say that. I didn't say that. What a coincidence, huh? He said, at that very moment, you came around the corner and asked me if I was a Christian. Later on, he lived in the south of town. He emailed one of our church members, I'm now trying to live this Christian faith that Johnny Pope introduced me to. With joy unspeakable, full of glory. You know all I heard that morning? You know all I heard that morning? Was a simple little song that I learned as a kid. Lead me to some soul today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. I mean, the Lord lobbed me a softball. I remember saying in my heart when I was about to pass the bus stop, I remember saying, Lord, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of Baptists right here in Houston that can witness to that guy. You don't really need me. It's like God said, I didn't ask anybody else but you right now to talk to him. Folks, God has given us the message of all messages. There's a lot of messages out there, a lot of great messages. What a great message we have in the Constitution of the United States. What a great message we have in the Declaration of Independence. What a great message we have in all the commandments of the Bible that we talked about, like to pray, to be loving our wives and so on. But what a great message he's given us 
to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Quit waiting for the missionaries to do your job. Let's support the missionaries so they can do our job. And let's pray and pray for our preacher and pay our preacher and don't muzzle the ox and take care of him. He's going to witness too. But please understand, it is not simply the job of the deacons or Sunday school teachers or people that sing in the choir. You know, I got a witness or else I'm not a good Sunday school teacher. I got a witness or I'm not a good deacon. Would you witness because you're a Christian? Would you witness because you're saved? The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In the matter of witnessing, silence isn't golden. It's just plain yellow. And I'm saying to you, yes, I'm saying to you, you cannot ignore this great commission. You cannot ignore this gospel message God has given you and me and expect to hear the trumpets in the morning and expect to hear God's voice speaking to you. To whom much is given, much is required. And to you who hear, more shall be given. He's waking you up every morning. He's wanting to talk to you as soon as you get up, get up and talk to you throughout the day in unbroken communication. But folks, there are three things that can break communication. Your desire for more than God's given you. Don't ever forget that. The doubt that comes into your mind that you're not addressing and you're not willing to let Him give you His faith. And then the denial of the message that God's given you, the death of the message in your heart can silence the voice of God in your life. Don't do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. On this evening, oh Lord, I pray that you'll speak to each and every one of us and let us hear your voice. Even tonight, I expect to hear your voice in the morning, Lord, as you promise, as you wake us up every morning. But on this invitation night here at Franklin Road Baptist, God speak to our hearts. Don't let any of us leave here without receiving what we need to receive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't we all stand up and let's go ahead and do an invitation here. And if anybody, God spoke to your heart, if it's like our church, if God speaks to your heart, we encourage you to come to the front and just kneel up here and get some things right with the Lord. If there's one person that needs to be saved, then come. Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. Meet with the preacher. Meet with Brother Joel over here. Give him your hand and say, I want to be saved. But if you need to just pray, come on up and let's pray. Would you come as we have that invitation?